Uh, hi everyone, welcome to another Taylor's discussion. Um, my name's Lee, this is Andrew. And uh, hey, um, we're, we're talking about the stone ape theory today. Um, an article that Andrew wrote on the Taylor's website and goes into a lot of detail about um, the stone ape theory and, and actually why it's a valuable uh, contribution to humanity, I think. So um, it's a great talk. So without further ado, let's just get to it. So I don't, I mean, I don't know much about the stone ape theory. I'm looking at your, your article that you posted. I mean, what I, you know, I, I have a very skewed view of it. And, um, just from what I've kind of heard about Terrence McKenna and the idea pretty much, um, that our ancestors long, long time ago, Neanderthals or whatever you want to call it, took some mushrooms because, um, they may have found it on animal dung or something like that and then through that there was some changes that happened in the brain over time and we kind of evolved with mushrooms to have some dramatic changes and that's where like our um advanced consciousness came from i don't know you you obviously know a lot more than i do so uh, so let's hear it yeah i don't know a little bit more i mean it's a it's a complex theory and it's mostly it's all terence mckenna because he's the one who came up with the idea it's he said he even said once that this was his one original idea that he's oh. that he's contributed he felt the first idea that was his um so uh i guess from how i understand it beginning is that at some point uh you know maybe two million years ago or whenever we started really diverging from i guess it would have been ch chimpanzees or our most our most common primate ancestor that exists today, which I think is chimps. Okay. Um, that that would have been occurring around two million years ago, and it would have been because of some kind of uh, environmental pressures uh, leading humans away from tropical rainforests where we were living uh, with, like all primates in Africa, and these selection pressures because it. You know, through, uh, throughout time, the environment changes and it affects uh, the world and, and it, uh, climate changes and thus changes how kind of food is available in the ecosystem. So at some point, or these um, early primates would have branched out away from the tropical rainforests into the savannas, uh, which in these savannas, there would have been migrating herds of, of like well, cattle and but pretty much ancestors of cattle and, and other, other migratory animals, buffalo, those kind of things, but not those, not those animals, but their ancestors or, or similar, uh, animals. And, um, and as a, as, as a means of just kind of finding alternate places for obtaining calories and food, humans would have naturally found that these that psilocybin cubensis, which grows perfectly out of cow dung or the dung of, you know, migratory animals, it would have been, it would have been right there as they branched out from the tropics. Uh, and, you know, some early humans would have experimented with taking these mu mushrooms. They would have seen it in dung and said, oh, what's this? Let's take it. And because these mushrooms give a, a wide array of evolutionary benefits, these these first humans who would have started, you know, taking, dropping uh, lots and lots of psilocybin cubensis, and we're talking lots and lots of uh, mushrooms, because if you just see a bunch of mushrooms, I mean, <laughs> you just see a bunch of food as a, as an ancient human, you, you eat it, especially if you need to. So it's like, yeah. I think there's this, there's this impulse where we have, we tend to quit why we, we hoard sugar and we just obsess that we go after sugar it comes from, you know, our time in the, in the rainforest when we, we would have been, uh, just like finding a tree with bananas, eating 40 bananas at a time, because otherwise you might not know when your next food source is going to be. So the same behavior, happens with psilocybin you see a load of psilocybin growing out of cow dung take as much as you can and uh 
which is not something modern humans kind of tend to want to do is take a bunch, but you can kind of easily see how taking so many would have really gotten these these evolutionary benefits going. And among these were probably the biggest one is visual acuity, mm. which uh, it, it just makes it, it, it the biggest effect that would have had would have been hunting ability uh, and also, you know, any kind of defense against other animals. And so that right there just up the evolutionary advantage game even further. Uh, and then it just spirals on from there with all mm. kinds of benefits. So, and from there, as, as humans would have taken these, these mushrooms over, you know, Terrence McKenna says hundreds of thousands of years, um, they would have gradually moved from this uh, looking like primates, the human brain would have been developing in a larger size, two or three times larger. Um, and we would have started creating this tr tribal structure based on alt altruism, um, basically orgies it would have been it's basically a big orgy culture. Um, creativity would have resulted, uh, the, the basic formations of religion through what I feel is animism, which is that's, that's what I could find is the earliest form of religion. And it absolutely makes sense with psilocybin. Um, and it also would have led to just uh, kind of a, the similar kind of thing that was happening in the 60s where people got, they immediately went back from societal structure back into community living. Mm. That's what it would have, would have occurred with psilocybin. And as long as people, as these humans would have been taking psilocybin, they would have pretty much been in the same tribal structure um, of, of this community building and, and also yeah, so it just has a lot of different effects like that. Um, and it, it, it kind of all makes sense with the research. There's there's no, we can't actually test it yet because um, for obvious reasons, because it, we can't go back 100,000 years ago and see what was actually going on. Yeah. But, but the, the, the research that lines up says psilocybin certainly could have done this. Hmm. There's absolutely no reason to say to believe that it could not have done it. And that, that would, that's what makes it compelling is just the, the fact that there's every bit of evidence that we are now discovering about psilocybin indicates that it would have a lot of the same effects that would have been required for humans to evolve from animals that are um, enslaved to our id, that, that kind of that, that base, that base, like, I'm just going to go eat and just it's just that base animal instinct inside mm -hmm. us to now this per these people that are manipulating the material world in all kinds of different ways, uh, creating all these abstract creations out of it, like art and religion and things that don't make sense anywhere else in the animal world and language. Um, it explains all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, uh, it's, what was your take on like, um, people saying, I mean, it, it sounds like it's it's you know, it has some scientific grounding and it explains a lot. Um, but like Mo Michael Pollan talked about, like agriculture being that that step, um, or cooking food and things like that, being able to cook food and then getting the extra nutrition from food or whatever. Um, that was like the the breach of what did it or whatever. Do you think maybe um, you know like? Why, why is Stone Ape Theory being the answer, or do you think it's a combination of things? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination, but my question to, you know, people like that would that point to other views like agriculture or cooking food or fire, fire on a more fundamental level of like, which, yeah. Um, where did humans, where did humans come up with that? Those are, those are entirely novel on their own. I find I find the idea that humans just spontaneously one day just created fire to not be that sounds great, but what what led to the creation of fire? What was it inside that led that first that first early human ancestor to realize I can rub rub sticks together or whatever to make smoke and create a fire? Like what was that epiphany? That's kind mm -hmm. of a it's just a leap of of, of thinking, um, as is 
agriculture and in, in in a lot of ways it's uh i mean and we can say it all happened kind of unconsciously but maybe but um I mean, agriculture is also so recent. That's another thing with that is it's so recent a, a invention, maybe really after the end of the last ice age. So 12,000 years ago. Wow. Um, yeah, it is interesting. Like there, there have to be, I mean, I think uh, people generally think that um, we just create stuff out of nothing, you know, and that, that implies that something created us too. It doesn't, it makes it so that, we are created so therefore we create i think that's like the process of the mindset but if you truly believe that humans kind of evolved and changed over time and that you know god just didn't magically make us into who we are on the planet then um there's no real creation involved there's just evolution and so thoughts and ideas and creativity isn't really creativity it's like an expression of what knowledge we already have so there has to be something in order to drive us to have a reason to do something. So like fire, like you were saying, has to come from somewhere. The idea has to come from some, you know, combination to get us to the point that we would make fire or something like that versus like yeah. um, something has to drive that versus like just us magically deciding, oh, there's, we need fire out of nowhere, you know? So that yeah. uh, it, it sounds more likely that something like, a um, weird outside source like a plant or a psychedelic of some kind or mushroom would confuse us or make us creative you know in a way like a mixture of ideas spontaneously in there to create this idea of fire or abstract idea of fire that we wouldn't normally have i don't know yeah absolutely it, it's uh it, it there has to be something there has to be some some kind of impetus that that would have caused that it's just uh I mean, and as well making any kind of tool uh a tool is it's just a it it's just this abstract way of now i view a rock and now i chip this rock away and i make this i make this rock into a pointy rock that can now i can now uh, dig out flesh with or i can i can get get further into uh various like coconuts or whatever i find out in nature it's like it just doesn't it just doesn't happen in a vacuum it, ha it happens um especially for animals otherwise you see it a little bit with primates and they're, they felt having some basic tools but um it's just uh yeah there's just, there's just a, a lot and there's a lot of strange things related to how humans get along with each other that doesn't really make sense. Um, we we're very sac self sacrificing. Uh, we we have an ability to to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Hmm. Uh, we have these the all these abilities coming from emotions that they're they're kind of the form of the bedrock of of uh, of how our modern civilization functions. Because without this this some kind of underlying interconnectedness with each other where we don't really, that is another thing that's not a really great explanation of where it came from is altruism, mm. which is this, this idea of why humans are willing to uh, sacrifice parts of their life to, to help others out. Um, and it came, it's, it's, it's been around for quite a quite a while and it's certainly was a critical piece to, to our civilization existing crazy um, i guess i guess i mean an interesting thing so i mean if you, so the with the stone day so it, it's ultimately unanswerable with with all these other theories and but the, when you get down to these other theories um that the, they're they're every bit as every bit as um circumstantial evidence as the stone day theory it's just the stone day theory i find is is interesting because it has it has this kind of a way of being almost like a unified explanation for a lot of these a lot of these explanations that are now explained off in these 10 different 10 different ways of explaining them hmm. uh that's that's kind of nice especially from a scientific perspective because that's what science scientists are always looking for they're looking for 
kind of one answer to to um, to uh, to give the explanation for everything, rather than here here's twenty different theories for how these different things came about. Scientists don't really like that. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, like, why why do you think so many people are skeptical about the stone ape theory? Like, um, people. I mean, you wrote this article and I spread it around and posted it about it, and people immediately had opinions um, regardless of reading it or not. They were just immediately thinking that it, the Stone Age theory is true or it's not. So I wonder why people are so opposed to the idea, maybe because it has stoned, you know, ape in it, you know, yeah. Yeah. it's kind of hip, hip, hippie terms, you know, but it's like, uh, I wonder, I wonder why so few people are judgmental towards it, not giving it a proper like look. Yeah, man, I think, I think it's, it's, that's part of it. Certainly it's the, uh, there's a huge, there's a huge natural, it's not natural. It's a stigma that has been culturally developed over the last, you know, 40 years with the war on drugs or 50 years at where, where we, a lot of people immediately kind of, um, just back away from anything having to do with psychedelics and it, it includes cannabis as well. It's, it's just a huge cultural shift that's now happened to be re undone mm -hmm. compared to the sixties. It's interesting. Um, like, uh, this brings me up an idea, like, um, this thing I continually see over and over again is like, um, you know, in religious groups or any type of practice or anything like that, people will consider like an outside source being cheating. So like, um, if you take a mushroom or something like that and you say you cheat, achieve enlightenment, you know, I've, I've never met anyone cause they'd be gone, but, um, but say you did, then people would look at that as a, you know, like, oh, you, you cheated, you cheated. And it's like, well, yeah. um, not really, but in the same sense, it's like, well, if a mushroom or some psychedelic made humans the way they are, you know, then that's cheating. That's, that's an outside thing. That's, that's some type of influence making us the way we are, not us making the way we are, you know? So it's like a weird, and also there's the idea that God created man, you know? And so it's like, you put that in the combination. It's like, well, a mushroom, if a mushroom made us the way we are, then we didn't make us the way we are. And God didn't make us the way we are. Then it was, yeah. you know? So it's like, um, and the evolutionists um, kind of want humans to make humans the way they are, it seems. Where the, the religious groups kind of want God or being to make us the way we are. And instead it seems like maybe it's a combination, you know, like a mushroom or something else outside of us drove us, had a driving force to make us the way we are, you know, it's, it's Absolutely, weird. Dude. That's a, that's a real, that's a great point. Um, especially with the, uh, the whole, the, the definitely religious people and scientists absolutely have a natural aversion like even Michael Pollan, he was very, uh, his book was pro psilocybin, yet it was very, very, very cautious about psilocybin. I mm -hmm. thought it was very overly cautious I and mean, he could have, he could have been given a much more, uh, I thought he went more on the side of caution rather than even than a neutral view. Um, but it, cause there's just this natural tendency for humans to think that I have to do, I'm going to do it all myself. And that, uh, especially with the, with, with any kind of meaning or spiritual experience or how, how we go about our lives in during this, this life we live, it's this, we're, we're kind of, we're all living in this illusion that we're, we're doing it ourselves. And so it's like, if someone says, uh, cannabis or psilocybin or all these things, uh, they were, they're polluting my body. They're polluting my, my temple, my connection with God or my, my scientific research. I'm like, well, then what about all the food you're eating? What about the, uh, the, the chemicals in your water supply, like chlorine and iodine? What about the, uh, the pesticides? What about, it's like everything that we're breathing in our current life. What about that? What's that, what's that doing? What, you know, all these other things that we're depending on coffee, uh, we're all depending on all these other things. So it's so it's, it's, it's a, it's a completely hypocritical stance for someone to to arbitrarily draw a division line between psychedelics are over here and they're bad. And then, but everything else that also influences my mind, like 
loads of sugar uh, or other drugs, those are okay. Uh, so it's, I think, I think it's once people get over that aversion, a lot of the resistance to the stone date theory uh, is aversion, just some kind of ingrained like attitude. I think that comes from our culture or just the West or just the Catholic church or, you know, the Christian churches. Um, certainly seems to come from a lot of that. Once they get over that, that, that will kind of open the door for a, a lot of people using these as medicines to improve their life rather than using uh, mental health prescription drugs. Why are those, those better than, than psilocybin as a mental health treatment or, you know, uh, and they'll also, but scientists will also start to actually be open to exploring this idea because it's generally just, it's, it's just laughed at because scientists Scientists are they're in their, they're known for being in their books. They're not known for being uh, psychonauts. Yeah. Uh, and there's not there's not too many that have been, especially kind of the hard scientists that look at evolution and biology and physics and math. Just not it's not well known for being a lot of scientists in those fields that would potentially be able to give the stone date theory more scientific uh, credence. Uh, they're not necessarily the most open to psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean my my favorite thing is like um, when somebody um, finds an error in a theory or a, really a stone ape uh, is a hypothesis because you can't you can't reproduce it, you know, like uh, just like any other origin um, story is a hypothesis. It's not a you know, it's not really a theory, but like people will discredit the entire hypothesis because of one aspect of it being wrong. They're like, Oh, it, that's been proven wrong. You know? And it's like, well, what part of it has been proven wrong, you know, and, and how so? And cause you can't test it. How can you prove that that's yep. wrong? So, I mean, uh, and like you said, it's a valid, it's as valid as any other hypothesis out there. And it, it but you know, people tend to discredit something because of, one thing said in there or um you know they think of it as an unchanging idea you can't change or modify it and i think people often think of science the same way it's like oh this is true you know science or science is wrong because they said it's this is true and then and then and now it's not so it's wrong it's all wrong and it's like well that's not that's not how it works here you know um so it's like you know people need to i think have a more open mind about like I, I generally thought the stone ape uh, hypothesis was incorrect too, um, yeah. until, you know, primarily Paul Stamets was like, hey, um, it's it's actually there's something there, and we're starting to look at it more, you know, and it's like, well, um, that's great, and it it brought me to this idea that well maybe maybe there is something there too, you know, because Paul Stamets said it said so, you know. But it took an authority to kind of go, yeah, there's something here for other people to go, oh, maybe there's something here, you know. But really, like, we should kind of do that all the time, I think. If somebody says something that's profound, it doesn't doesn't mean everything they say is going to be profound. It just means that, um, you know, there's little gems in everything that everyone has to say, I think, including Terrence McKenna's work, you know. It's not all just bullshit. There's, there's good stuff in there, too. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's absolutely. Um, I get, and I there was a, I mean, an in, interesting, uh, I mean, interesting idea is, is was that I when I was doing this research, uh, just a kind of a, a contradiction I came across was, so if psilocybin could have, I mean, it definitely could have been the source of religion, and therefore religion as the source of culture and, and creativity and art, and well, creativity would have preceded religion probably. But it's like as as a religion religion is kind of the beginning of where this whole human experiment that we're now we're now seeing in in all its different forms today that that's where it began um why and then humans terence mckenna felt that humans were living in, in kind of peace and harmony in these tribes for hundreds or tens of thousands of years you know and they while they were taking psilocybin i started wondering well, why what then what changed because mm -hmm. something changed in the modern you know in not in the modern world but it, in the in the in the time when humans made the shift from 
these hunter gatherer uh, structures where they were egalitarian, people were equal, there was no division lines, uh, men and women were having sex with, you know, or men were having procreating with all the females in the tribe. Like, so there was, it was like an open sexual uh, atmosphere, which would have given evolutionary benefits and whatnot. So what, and but some, something all of a sudden that, that changed and we started settling down, we started planting crops and we started now uh, creating these, these division lines again between each, ourselves. And so what, what kind of makes sense, what Terrence McKenna was saying is that at some point, you know, whether this was, you know, whenever agriculture developed or slightly before, the st people stopping to take psilocybin would have suddenly brought back this whole, um, I mean, a, a, you know, word is egocentrism or if it's, it's, being, it's being completely controlled by like our base desires, it's like the id, uh, this, this, this force that, that could have I kind of kept humans in the animal realm as primates, just I'm going to go eat, eat and uh, consume and have sex and do nothing else with my time, like create. Um, that, that stopping taking psilocybin, say for uh, the Sahara turning into a desert, uh, for example, that was one idea, or just just uh, the changing climate where mm -hmm. these herds aren't, aren't look, we're not, we're no longer following these herds and picking uh, psilocybin out of the dung stopping this this psilocybin thing would have ultimately brought humans back to that 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 default that default state we would have gradually gone back to this this more self-centered um way of being mm. which would have then i mean I, I, that i i kind of see that as then the the uh, the genesis of civilization at mm. some point uh, because that's when people started hoarding, hoarding wealth. Uh, authoritarian authoritarian structures started uh, coming into play again. Um, all these kind of things so that are the modern trappings of our of our world uh, would have resulted only when psilocybin people stopped taking psilocybin. That's so, a great point. Where is it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um... I mean, I, I think that people really need to go through and read uh, what you had to, to write about, um, about the Stone Ape theory, because you, you bring a lot in there from, like, resources and stuff like that to actually kind of support the uh, the theory and or the hypothesis and make it really into something that um, people can clearly understand versus, like, um, you know, what people generally get is this um, more new age view of the Stone Ape theory where it's just kind of, I don't think it's um, uh, attacks the real, you know, it doesn't apply to the real theory that Terrence McKenna was going on about or the research that kind of supports that um, hypothesis. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting. What, what are some of the like common misconceptions that you've run across with the Stone Dave theory? Uh, I mean, like... you know, that uh, it, it created consciousness or, um, you know, that this was like, you take one much i think for me like it's this it's this magical idea that you know some ape dropped one mushroom you know and then that that changed everything um you know it magically just made all these connections happen and it didn't it wasn't people using it or our ancestors using it for long periods of time doing changes you know over who knows how long you know thousands of years using mushrooms as a food source you know primarily and stuff like that so another thing yeah. that people often think is that animal i've heard this that animals don't actively seek out hallucinogens which is absolutely true and false so i mean we you know, we've seen animals like eat mushrooms and get high all the time more you know they're very drawn to that type of stuff and people tend to think that animals don't seek out of them because they find it an uncomfortable experience or something like that but as you know and i know humans <laughs> actively seek these things out yeah. you know and humans are animals yeah. and animals do the same thing and that's i mean you just throw catnip out there in front of a cat you know and that's kind of a way to prove that cats by themselves are really interested in changing their con consciousness um 
they're almost addicted to it, you know? So it's like, yeah, it's like a no brainer. Absolutely. I could, I could, I can definitely relate with the stone, with the whole idea of like the stone date theory as well, because once you, once you start using psilocybin, uh, I mean, you can absolutely go back to not using psychedelics, but eventually your, I mean, your brain, it'll, the psilocybin or other psychedelics will disrupt that something, some default, you know, mode network or your, the normal egocentrism that we kind of tend to build up. It'll, it'll absolutely disrupt that, but you'll, you'll go back to that eventually. And so I can see in myself, there's an absolutely an appeal of, as a way of, you know, treating mental health or just living a, living a more enjoyable life. This is something I would like to have as part of my life. Absolutely. The rest of my days, 100%. And, uh, you can see how, you know, early, early, our early, uh, human ancestors would have would have felt the same because um, it gives it gives such a feeling of joy and contentment with our own with something inside us um, it's very subjective but it's like you just feel at ease um, uh, with with your life and I can so yeah, it, yeah. I don't see you know whatever whatever animals go through it there's is there there's no reason to think that animals also can't find that kind of a experience experience through through hallucinogens yeah that makes sense to you well hopefully uh people will check out your uh your article man um i think it's well written and people should really pay attention to that